Eli, do you want to get started? Sure thing. All right. Welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Eli Leland. I am CTO and co-founder at Voltaic, and I would like to welcome you to our October webinar discussing our relationship with the University of Michigan Battery Lab. We are joined today by Greg Less, uh, Battery Lab Technical Director at the U University of Michigan Battery Lab. Uh, he's in Ann Arbor, and uh, my co-founder and uh, Voltaic CEO, Tal Schulklopper, who's coming to you from Berkeley, and I today am in Albuquerque, New Mexico. So uh, glad to welcome folks from uh, around the country and around the world. Uh, after the webinar, we'll uh, be opening up the event to an interactive Q&A, so please do submit your questions throughout the webinar. Um, and a few housekeeping notes. So the audience will be muted for the duration of the webinar. If you should have any questions, please use the question module. And if you have any technical issues, please uh, reach us via the chat module and we'll work with you to help resolve them as quickly as possible. Uh, we have also included some assets for you to download in the handout section of the module. We've included the written version of uh, this case study um, outlining our work with the Uni University of Michigan, uh, our build versus buy ebook, uh, for those of you considering um, bringing battery intelligence capability into your organizations, uh, as well as our ebook on preparing for the electrification tsunami uh, as the world transitions to battery power, something that we are very excited about and have been working for the last 10 years to help uh, promote and accelerate. Wonderful. So welcome, Tal, welcome, Greg, and welcome, all of you. And let's uh, kick things off. So uh, first up, Greg, um, for those who are unfamiliar, can you just tell us a bit about the University of Michigan Battery Lab and how your organization is bringing value to the battery ecosystem? Sure, yeah, and uh, let me start by saying thanks for having me. Um, the University of Michigan Battery Lab came about when uh, in the 2012, 2013 timeframe, small startups and academic groups were going to Ford Motor Company and presenting them data in maybe coin cell format cells from coin cell format cells. Uh, and Ford said, hey, you know, this is really great data. We'd, we'd love to look at it more closely, but it would be a lot better if this were in an automotive format cell or at least closer to an automotive format cell because a lot changes between a coin cell and, and a car battery. Um, and, and there wasn't really a good place for, for these startups to go at the time. Um, Ford thought about building a, a facility at Dearborn to make it sort of an internal capability, uh, but they decided it would be better to create something that was open to the entire ecosystem, the entire battery supply chain. Um, they could use it, the university could use it, anybody could use it. So uh, they came to us and they gave us some money, they gave us their homework, and um, the battery lab was created. So. Uh, what we are is a service unit on campus. Uh, you can think of us as a maker space. We have experts in making and testing batteries. We have equipment for making and testing batteries. Uh, and we welcome users from across the supply chain spectrum. Uh, they come here, they do, they do their work, and they leave uh, in exchange for money. We don't take IP, we don't publish, we don't seek grants with other people's data. We're literally just here to help people make their batteries and test them. Yeah, that's awesome. And I think in the time that we've been working in the industry, we definitely see uh, promoting exchange and, and collaboration as a, as a key thing to helping to move the, uh, the industry forward. So you know, we're glad to, to be working with you to help, help on that on that front. Um, so this uh, next question is for both uh, both uh, Tal and Greg. So you've both been in the industry for quite some time. Um, let's kind of rewind to, you know, before the uh, Battery Lab uh, came into being. What, what did you see as the status quo and key challenges around battery development, um, testing, and analysis before the UM Battery Lab opened? Maybe we can start with Tal. Sure. Yeah, I just remember back uh, going back to PhD programs or even before that, and uh, startups and others. It's you know it's data that's generated on you know materials, information in lab notebooks. There's you know the data on the testers that you know the software may not be great at actually analyzing it, and so it was a lot of you know manual work in putting that into spreadsheets, Excel, building together you know, custom, you know, macros and Python scripts and things like that, sort of kludging together all those different pieces. But it was just a lot of brute force trying to find, you know, where the relevant data was, trying to put together all those relevant pieces as you're 
trying to, you know, develop that next generation of material or start manufacturing products. It was just, just a whole lot of disparate information that took a lot of, you know, time sitting at your desk and trying to figure out and analyze. Yeah, that was, that's yeah. pretty much exactly my experience. Um, you know, working in startups, it was, everybody was doing their own test with maybe their own parameters. Uh, the data was stored on the cycler and maybe it was being backed up to another computer. Or maybe it wasn't. Once the computer on the cycler was full, that data got erased if you hadn't saved it. But where did you save it? How did you name it? Uh, once you put it in Excel and you plotted it and you were trying to compare it to somebody else's data and they plotted it differently, you had to put everything back into Excel and replot it. And it, it was just a ton of time that was wasted. And, you know, actually one of the things that, that Voltaic has taken care of in terms of Excel plotting, it's it's not just putting it into Excel and plotting it, it's when you have a ton of data points, Excel just slows down and bogs down and then you've got this image file you're trying to put into PowerPoint that's so big, nothing works. And and Excel, uh, Voltaic took care of that for us. So I'm jumping ahead to, to you know, sort of the, the why I love uh, Voltaic, but, um, there were, there were just so many problems with how we handled data before that, that yeah. Indeed, yeah, no, that, I think that's a, that's a great overview of the data challenges that are kind of inherent to uh, working in the battery ecosystem and engineering uh, new battery technologies. But if I were to sort of zoom out and direct this to Greg, um, prior to, you know, independent of the, uh, uh, the data analysis, prior to the existence of the UM Battery Lab, what alternatives or paths were available to you know innovators researchers companies academics that felt like they had some uh, valuable new uh, battery material or battery technology uh, that wanted to expose it to industry and and try and accelerate its path to commercialization what was that man, like you know before, um, before your lab it was hard um you know there, there was a lot of uh kludging stuff together to try to replicate or or simulate large-scale manufacturing. Um, I, I took multiple business trips to companies that had coders but didn't know anything about batteries. So we were shipping mixers and shipping material and shipping balances and no dry room. And But, but it was a real coder. So you were getting more than a, a sheet of notebook paper worth of electrode at a time. So there were trade-offs and then you got that material and you tried to build it into a cell and it really wasn't a cell in anything but name. And then you had that data and you were going out to conferences to try to catch people's eye and say, hey, look, we've got this cool new thing. And if you give us some money, we can buy better equipment to get better data. And it was just sort of this iterative process that really all came back to, can you get money to get the equipment, to get the better data, to get more money, to get it? It, it was a disaster. So. Having some sort of a shared resource for allowing people to scale up, um, I think, is really a game changer. Indeed, yes. And so, you know, uh, it, it's a challenge that a lot of early stage battery companies face is, you know, to really outfit uh, even a small scale pilot production line and test facility is you're talking many millions of dollars. Um, and well, you know, yeah, outside of that, really I was just meeting, yeah, I was meeting with the CEO of a startup locally here in the Bay Area. Just earlier today, and like they are building that larger, they're making that investment in pile facility, but it's 18 months until all the equipment comes in right now, and then there's the ramp time figuring out how to use it, get all that stuff together, and just the the timelines aren't there. You know, if you you can't just wait for all that to magically come together, even if you're already to make that uh, take that next step here. So yeah, and I just see facilities like Rag is just being you know, really great for bridging that gap. Yeah, that's that's absolutely true. The, the wait times are really long, and um, I, I think the learning curve is not insurmountable, but it's steep. And I, I got lucky, and I found people that already knew how to do battery manufacturing at, at the larger scale when, when we were setting up. So having the expertise so that the machines aren't another problem that you have to overcome is really huge. Yeah, and so for those in the audience who uh, who aren't as familiar with the UM Battery Lab, effectively you can come to the lab with 
you know, some new uh, innovation, some material that, you know, is a substitute, you feel like will be a better replacement for something that's in uh, large scale battery manufacturing. And Greg and his team have the equipment and facilities to build cells uh, and, uh, and test them against, you know, baseline standard formulations. And of course, share that data uh, across the industry. Um, so let's, uh, let's talk a little bit more about how, uh, how we started working together. So um, Greg, um, how did you initially engage with Voltaic and what were the specific problems you were looking to solve uh, as we began that relationship? So, uh, you know, I first encountered Voltaic um, and, and the two of you at uh, the North American Battery Show in Novi, Michigan um, on the vendor floor. Uh, I was, you know, walking around looking at the different booths, seeing if there was anything that I could put in my lab once it opened up. Um, and I was initially attracted by the bottle of whiskey that you had on the table in exchange for a uh, business card. But once we started talking and I realized the the problems I didn't know I was going to have that Voltaic could solve, it was really a no-brainer to you know have you on to campus and give us a bigger demonstration and really walk us through uh, the nuts and bolts because man, um, I, I didn't I wasn't specifically looking for a solution because I didn't realize that I was going to have a problem. But once I started talking to to the two of you uh, and it, it quickly became obvious that with a user facility where I was going to have outside companies coming in and generating cycling data, I needed a way not only to manage that data, but to protect the intellectual property that was being generated. So I couldn't have users from company A touching the same computer that company B was cycling on, because that's how you, you, you lose competitive knowledge, right? So Voltaic, gave me a way to not only collect that data and isolate it in different work groups, different projects behind a password, but it also made me made it possible that I wouldn't have to hire someone to distribute that data out to other people. So uh, being a web-based solution, uh, all of the data loads to the cloud. I don't have to worry about running out of space on my computers. And I don't have to worry about having an employee sitting there going through the data, answering questions from the different companies and, and students who are working here, sending out updates, et cetera. It's, it's all just there. They can go and see that data for themselves and, and manage it themselves. I effectively prevented, I, I'm effectively down a full-time equivalent by having Voltaic instead of a human interfacing with uh, the computers. Awesome. That was rambling, but I think that answered the question. <laughs> Indeed, yeah, and uh, just shorthand, that bottle of whiskey, just to be clear, we don't give a bottle of whiskey to everyone who gives us a trade <laughs> trade show, <laughs> but it is, an, it, is a, it is one of our trade show hacks uh, that we put out a fishbowl, collect business cards, and then do a drawing on uh, at, the end of the, at the end of the trade show, and it's, uh, it's amazing how many fruitful conversations uh, spring forth from, uh, from that type of... Uh, gesture. So yeah, Tal, I wonder if you have anything to add uh, as regards uh, any of the things that Greg brought up, perhaps around IP considerations or otherwise. Yeah, I think that's been one of the fundamental challenges in the space is just getting the different parties who ultimately need to work together to be comfortable to share the right information uh, and, you know, product to each other. And you know, a big frustration for materials companies is, you know, you can give a customer, you know, a, send over a bottle of materials, you know, send, throw that over the fence and then just hope for the best and they can put it together into a, you know, scalable battery that, you know, hopefully will work. Uh, or you can go to a facility like Greg's and, you know, do that collaboratively, get this into a common form factor that everyone accepts and, uh, just really create that collaboration and comfort across the multiple parts of the ecosystem. Um, you know, whether it's the, you know, just creation of the cells, you know, creating data that people could actually trust. And then really, you know, from its, the, the early days at Voltaic, just the, that data security has really been key. There's a lot of, you know, concern in the battery space around, you know, IP, you know, rightfully so. And just really, you know, at its core, building a software platform that could deal with that uh, IT security requirements. You know, from the early days, it's been you know top of mind for us working with user facilities, where multiple auto companies, multiple you know startups with similar competing technologies are coming, and just 
really doubling down and making sure the platform goes through their, those regular security audits, the penetration tests, and uh, really have a solution that is, you know, uh, meets the needs for this, you know, industry that is, uh, has very differentiated IP uh, across the space. Indeed. You know, batteries are big business. It's no secret. Uh, cat's out of the bag on that one. And uh, and IP, IP is king. You know, we work with a lot of different companies that uh, that consider their, you know, things like their cycling data, like Greg was talking about, to be very closely held core IP. So it's uh, something we take very seriously in terms of um, maintaining that trust with the community uh, to ensure that our software is uh, is secure and, and provides those kind of protections that Greg talked about. So, um, Greg, in addition to the uh, out-of-the-box capabilities of Voltaic that you uh, that you outlined, um, were there any uh, sort of customization or configuration that the Voltaic team was able to provide to you know tailor the system to your specific needs? Yeah, you know, so um, there's one in-the-box piece that's that's really helpful that. Uh, for me, um, I, I sort of alluded to this. I don't, I don't watch my users' data. Um, I don't know what they're looking for. I don't know what their criteria for a good cell, bad cell is. But to quickly just say, look, I want to plot percent initial capacity versus cycle number, and say, okay, maybe they're not watching this. This cell is at 50% initial capacity, and I can send them an email and say, have you checked your data lately? It looks like these cells are dead, and I'm charging you for every day that it's sitting on the cycler maybe you should go through your data and, and weed out cells that you're ready to take off that's that's really helpful for me but um the custom tool that that i think actually you programmed for me eli specifically was a billing tool so uh as you might imagine as a, a user facility we charge our users per cell per day on channels uh, and rather than trying to do the nightmare task of keeping a manual list of this cell was started on this day and it ended on that day. I can just go into Voltaic, pull up every cell that was cycling during the billing period that I'm looking at and hit the custom button. It's a button that says billing. It runs and it tells me exactly how many days each customer has been using what resource. Uh, and then I pop it into a spreadsheet and send it off to uh, collections. It's it's fantastic. Indeed, yeah. That, so that's uh, what Greg's talking about is our reporting functionality, where you can configure, you know, ad hoc uh, on-demand reports on various different types of things. So uh, it's you know, candidly, it's not a use case we were considering when we when we built that feature, but we were very uh, very glad that it uh, helped streamline operations uh, for Greg and his team. Um, I'm wondering, so the lab has been open around seven years, is that right? Uh, uh, 2015, yeah, yep, yep, yep. So seven years next month. I'm just curious if you have any comments as to kind of an evolution in, in how the lab's being used in terms of the types of people that are coming to it, in the, the collaborations that you're seeing between the different entities, is it is it pretty steady state or are, have things changed um, over time? Things have changed over time, um, you know, sort of, sort of with the standard lay of the land. Um, we see users that come in, get really excited, use a whole bunch of time, and then their use tails off as they either get acquired, uh, get their own equipment, or go out of business, frankly. Um, uh, the going out of business is is rare. It, it's very rare. Um, but you know, there have been some startups that just didn't make it past the startup phase, or uh, you know, large companies that they decided to pivot and move away from that type of battery research. And that's fair. And I like to think that we helped them while they were here, and I wish them luck in their next endeavors. Um, for those that have stayed, you know, uh, we started and. NMC 111 was king, just like everywhere else. Uh, and over time, the nickel content has just gone higher and higher, which has necessitated us to change our uh, techniques, change some of our equipment so that we can deal with the, the higher sensitivity of the nickel. Um, you know, early on, we saw a lot of big companies bringing in small companies in sort of a three-way partnership. That's 
that's changed a little bit um, and that could just be who's coming versus who isn't um, but definitely definitely uh, the proverbial hockey stick of interest over time um, anybody that tells you that lithium-ion isn't a big deal is absolutely wrong um, you know th there is not enough capacity in this country to meet the demand right now at any level regarding the batteries so you know everything keeps changing indeed yeah, yeah I think the, that. well one fact you bring up you know uh, greg i think quarterly opens up uh openings to use the facility to uh, make your cells and they get booked up in about an hour right each time it's just that that demand is uh insane yeah yeah it's like a rock concert um, it is it you know um I, I'm waiting to hear for the first time that somebody is scalping their time for more than we're uh, we're renting it for. That would be bad, but kind of cool too. <laughs> <laughs> I will uh, I will set aside for the moment the question of whether you're going to start issuing NFTs or some other kind <laughs> of Web3 crypto uh, solution to uh, to booking your uh, time on your uh, on your pilot line. Um, so uh yeah looking ahead can is there anything uh that you can share about future plans for the battery lab greg yeah so um it's i, I can't i can't go into specifics uh for a variety of reasons but we're definitely going forward with what we're calling battery lab 2.0 um it will be bigger faster um pilot line uh, it will have a dedicated teaching and research line so that uh, students can get in there and not just do research on batteries, but also learn how to make batteries. Um, as we're transitioning from internal combustion to electric vehicles, Southeast Michigan and Michigan in general um, is going to see a big change in the workforce. Uh, and a lot of people are going to need training, education to fit into the new world. Um, and we're hoping to, to really help with that not just give them you know hypotheticals and, and classroom examples but lab time where they can see the machine touch the machine break the machine fix the machine whatever they need to do to, to really be ready for these new jobs um, and then of course like sort of the third the third arm is focus on solid state uh, everybody's moving to beyond lithium ion whether that's sulfur ceramic silicon um, whatever there's all new challenges in that landscape and we're looking to tool up to be able to tackle those with people. And um, we've we've moved past just cells. Uh, we're we're exploring uh, module and pack welding. And if that really is a popular demand, uh, we will have module and pack testing as well. Fantastic! Yeah, it's it's really been exciting to see how. Uh, um, how the industry has grown and exciting to see that uh that your facility is is growing uh to meet to meet that growing demand and i think another thing that's really special to us about uh our relationship with your lab and with the university of michigan of course tal and i both come from an academic background and we both worked in, in startups and it's uh it's it's really uh it's gratifying for us to be able to help support that collaboration between the academic community uh and the uh, startup community and the community of larger industrials um, because ultimately it's going to take uh it's going to take a lot of collaboration across those different um groups in order to drive the industry forward and, and meet the goals that we all share um so tala uh I'd, I'd love to hear from you about um you know we have this new uh initiative that we recently announced we'll take community edition and um I'd love to hear from you how how you feel like that fits into uh this sort of collaborative dynamic we've been discussing. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, it's uh, whether it's your internal testing or you know something you go make at uh, Greg's facility at the University of Michigan. Um, you know, it just takes a lot of time and money to generate you know these cells and generate the data from them. And you know, what we saw is just a tremendous amount of interest from uh, you know people at big companies, academics. You know, just uh, you know, startups looking to try to get into the battery sector and, you know, a constant challenge for them is like, how do we, you know, bootstrap? How do we get this information? How do we get this data that we can start doing interesting things with? Um, how do we actually learn, you know, what does this data look like? Um, and so, 
you know, it was one of the early ideas we had with Voltaic, but the industry wasn't ready for it quite yet. Uh, but really what we've created now is we call Voltaic Community, and it's a freemium solution that you could sign up for uh, for free and get access to a whole range of open source data that's already on there and loaded in. It's all, you know, not, uh, you know, historically when you got open source data, it's all in a variety of different formats with different labeling and just takes forever just to get it even into a way you can look at it. And so this is all takes advantage of like our core platform we've developed for our industrial customer base and puts it all into this common language and already extracts some key features from it and just makes it really easy to go in and explore this large open source data set. You could start bringing in additional private data and look at it there. You could open source additional data through the software. Uh, and then the other side of it is, you know, ultimately, uh, in order for this industry to move quickly, you're going to need very, you know, good analytics to help, you know, predict the lifetime of things, to model out next generation materials. Um, you know, just batteries take too long to test and qualify to see how they're going to perform. And so, you know, modern analytics, machine learning, AI, even basic statistics uh, are really going to be key here. And so we're, you know, creating an environment within that community where you could actually build uh, additional Python and MATLAB models uh, directly against uh, you know, all the open data and private data and Voltaic community that you have access to. And you could then open source those as well, have those as examples, and then people can go and build off of that and integrate directly with GitHub to you know, share and uh, you know, fork and you know, build their own custom IP on top of that uh, in a very collaborative way. And so, so something we're really excited about, uh, just as far as this mission of like helping retrain and helping create access to this broader community of people moving into the, the battery space. Greg, any perspectives uh, uh, how Voltaic community uh, can contribute on the academic side since, as you're part of a flagship yeah. research institution? Um, I mean, not just on the academic side, I'll, I'll start with an industrial anecdote. When we first started the battery lab, before we had any machines, uh, you know, we were obviously meeting with people, um, and I was approached by a representative of a very large company, uh, cell manufacturer, who was trying to convince me that it should be my job to aggregate, aggregate data like this and make a library of open source data. And while I agreed it was a fantastic idea, I had no idea how I could do it. So, um, you know, it's really exciting to me that Voltaic has figured this out and is, is making it happen. Um, I, I think it's going to move things forward. On the academic side, you know, prior to, to working in the battery lab, I was working with a modeling team. Um, I was building them cells. They were modeling the cells. Uh, but what we really needed was, was more than what I could do. Um, you know, we needed this information. We needed uh, cycling, life cycling, failure analysis, all of the data that you just can't get when you buy a cell off the shelf without really digging into it and probably breaking some rules um, to, to make the models better. You know, you, you need to not only be able to build the model, you need, once you have a model built, you need to validate it, uh, and, and this is going to help. Um, and even if you're not talking about modeling, if you're just talking about students trying to get into the battery space, having real world data is huge. It's just huge. You know, um, you can show it in a lecture. You can make homework problems off of it. You can make test problems off of it. You can make whole research problems off of it. I, I see having this open source data opening up tons of new research projects for students across the battery spectrum. Spectrum. I think it's going to be a really great resource. Indeed, and yeah, as, as Tal mentioned, it's something that we've uh, wanted to do for a very long time, um, but, uh, uh, you know, given, given our common background in, in um, the academic side, you know, when we meet students uh, who see what our software tools can do just in terms of uh, automation and acceleration and, you know, how much time it would just save them in their, you know, PhD work or their classwork or, or what have you. And it's it sort of tugged at our heartstrings not being able to provide uh, Voltaic to that community. So that's something that we've been really excited about. And then the other thing that we've observed that has grown up just in the last couple of years is this, you know, really uh, uh, 
vital collaborative activity around battery data science and algorithm development um, in Slack communities and like GitHub projects that lots of people are looking at and contributing to. But the one thing that they were lacking was, was data, right? Just getting enough data to say, okay, I've got this model, predictive model, it works great on this data, but just getting some other data to, to yeah. validate it on or tweak, fine tune it on um, was almost an ins insurmountable challenge um, for, you know, small teams, individual researchers, et cetera. So, um, um, so it's something we're, we're really excited about. Um, as as far as we'll take community. Um, so to the audience, I wanna just remind everyone uh, that you have the opportunity to submit questions. Uh, they have started to come in and we're excited to see that. We'll get to those in a bit after a little bit more discussion, but please, please. Yeah, for those interested in Voltaic community, uh, you can just, uh, it's in closed beta right now, but if you sign up on voltaic.com uh, slash community, uh, you'll be able to get there and uh, uh, sign up to be on the list to be one of the early users. Indeed, yes. Thanks for that uh, that plug. Um, so, Greg, I I'm, oh I'm yeah, just please, go ahead. For a second. So, just to just to talk about the in, you said you mentioned insurmountable task of gathering the data, and I, I I don't know who everyone in our audience is here today, but if you've not gathered battery data before, I just want to highlight how long it can take to get data. Um, you know, a a hundred channels. So 100 cells of testing is $200,000 and maybe a 12 month lead time right now. So once you've spent that money, you have 100 cells you can test. So you put 100 cells on and depending on what testing you're doing, it could maybe be a day to get data, but more likely it's six months to a year to get a full data set. You very quickly use up those 100 channels and that $200,000 if you have to wait six months to a year. So it becomes a, again, you're chasing money to get more equipment, to get more data, to get more money, to get more equipment. Having the data just given to you through open source is amazing. It's just amazing. It's gonna change stuff. Awesome. Um, so uh, pivoting just a little bit. So, you know, Greg, I know uh, prior to uh, your work at the Michigan Battery Lab, you've been involved in battery startups and scale up and manufacturing. I wonder if you have any perspectives on the uh, recently passed Inflation Reduction Act and the goals around setting up domestic supply chain for battery materials and manufacturing. Um, huge, a absolutely huge. Um, you know, this is another one of those things that people have talked about forever that needed to happen and no one really knew how to get it across the starting line. Um, a domestic supply chain is going to change a lot. Uh, you know, right now, um, all of my equipment is from Korea. Uh, I don't have anybody on my staff that speaks Korean. And even if I did, there's a 13 hour time difference. So what usually ends up happening is a machine breaks. I send an email. The next morning, I get a response. I respond to that response. The next morning, I get a response. And we iterate like that for a week before we're able to communicate exactly what the problem is and how to fix it. And if the problem is something that needs a replacement part, it's six months before I get something. Um, I don't think that onshoring any of the supply chain is going to negate the developed supply chain in Asia or Europe. It's going to augment it and it's gonna move everything forward faster. Um, you know, right now I'm in multiple discussions about a national network of pilot lines that will look an awful lot like the Michigan Battery Lab. I don't see that as competition. I see that as collaboration. We're gonna learn from each other, we're gonna work together, and we're gonna move ahead very, very quickly. Uh, you know, the lithium ion battery was invented in 1991. Uh, in 2008, the uh, whatever Obama's uh, economic stimulus package was for batteries, uh, helped A123 and Enerdell. Neither of them did so well because it was a little too early. Now, 2020, you know, 20 years later, lithium ion is to a point where we're getting serious and we're going fast and we're trying to, to make it a viable product to change the world. Hopefully, um, solid state 
with the Inflation Reduction Act and all of this network of development and collaboration and cooperation that's being fostered right now won't take two decades. It'll take a half a decade or a decade. And whatever's next after that will be even faster because we will have that spirit and we'll have those resources here already. Awesome. Tal, do you have any thoughts on the, the key challenges and opportunities uh, to meeting the goals of the Inflation Reduction Act? Yeah, I, I love that they started off with raw materials uh, with some of the, the new, recent funding they just announced. And it, it's frankly, all this is going to take time to really come to fruition, but we're making the investments that are needed to start building up this domestic supply chain. And, you know, ultimately, you know, batteries are heavy component if you have to ship it across the globe and all the different materials. And so you need to near source as much as you can uh, around these systems in order for, you know, this industry to develop, you know, and power, you know, 50% of our EVs in 2030, like some of the projections are saying and all that. So it's, we're making the necessary investments to start building up all these components, but it will take time. And I think one of the key challenges, whether it's waiting for materials, waiting for uh, equipment to come in, uh, training staff who knows how to do this stuff is uh, just how quickly you can get there. Um, I think, you know, one of the big challenges, frankly, that's going to hit the space is that, you know, valley of death between, you know, when you raise that, you know, $100 million or multiple billion dollars, um, you know, by between ordering that capital equipment, the, you know, personnel burn, when you could actually make these cells and devices. Um, I think, you know, frankly, you know, if you, we did things the old way, you look at, you know, whether it's Panasonic or LG who know how to make batteries right now, it takes them you know, four or five years to get to profitability on those things. And, uh, you know, they know how to make batteries. They have large balance sheets to support all this stuff. Um, you know, the only way we're going to be able to compete and hit the, the volume, the quality level, keep the cost down for these factories is with, you know, automation and analytics. And it's just really, you know, we're, we're really excited about doubling down on that space and providing the, the analytics to help accelerate the yield ramp of these new factories. So it doesn't take that four to five years. It doesn't take, uh, it's easier to identify those quality issues before they actually get into customers' hands and we have fires in people's garages. Like that, that's still the reality of where we're living in. It's even for those who have been in the space for a long time, who have that trained personnel, who already have that, those equipment suppliers and everything. Um, it's, it is a hard process today, and we just need to get smarter uh, about how we do it. And, uh, you know, at Voltaic, that's really, I think, just the, really the core of what we're going to be doing uh, over the next couple of years here is helping accelerate that uh, domestic and international you know, manufacturing capability uh, in this battery sector. Indeed. Uh, and, I, you know, looking ahead, right, so it's, it's this constant theme coming up that um, – all the auto OEMs have announced, you know, a number of new electric vehicle programs. Many of them are uh, projecting to transition to fully electric or mostly electric uh, within the next several years or next decade. And, you know, every, everyone's talking about how there's not enough, you know, there's not enough battery uh, manufacturing capacity. Um, and that's something for sure that the IRA is putting, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act is putting a lot of uh, financial resources toward. Um, but I'm wondering uh, if either or both of you have perspectives on the human capital that needs to be uh, developed in order to achieve these goals, and uh, you know any any thoughts on on how we can meet the meet the demand for all the all the brilliant people that uh, need to join us uh, in this uh, in this initiative. Well. Um... So, you know, part of, part of the Battery Lab 2.0 is being wrapped into an announced University of Michigan Electric Vehicle Center. Um, and the mission of that electric vehicle center is not just research, it's also training. Uh, U of M is bringing online uh, engineering certificates, degrees, focuses, uh, you know, trying to do targeted hires for uh, battery faculty, uh, for PhD students. And we're going to be working closely with um, not just community colleges, but high school and even middle school to get students thinking about STEM, thinking about batteries, thinking about all of this as a viable career forward um, and developing the curricula that will be necessary for those students to be trained appropriately. Yeah. Tal, do you have any uh, perspectives? Uh, you know, since we, we've, we've seen a lot across the ecosystem about how uh, 
how organizations are, you know, perhaps bringing in talent from outside the battery industry and keys to success there? Yeah, I think, you know, something like the Voltaic uh, community is, is one of those areas uh, that we you know, hope will help accelerate some of this learning and workforce development. But another big part is really uh, pushing out common standards and best practices in the space. There's a lot of these things that, frankly, people don't figure out until, you know, they've messed up and, you know, it just doesn't work out. And whether it's setting up a test protocol or, you know, how to align your battery to get welded, you know, there's just so many of those little learnings out there that uh, is really important to, you know, disseminate uh, and help those new folks getting into the space, you know, move forward. Um, and so there's a couple of those initiatives. Uh, you know, Voltaic Community is the first one we've uh, launched. We're also uh, open source the uh, open standard for battery data we call VDS uh, that is about to come out of publication. We'll put it out there publicly on GitHub as well. Uh, and then also, you know, best practices around naming conventions, uh, how to run test protocols and things like that. Uh, that I think is just going to be important and just the continued, uh, you know, resources around, you know, uh, training new engineers. And uh, I just, you know, been involved with the uh, University of Michigan and the uh, battery manufacturing short course that they're doing and just love to see, you know, engineers love that as we're again moving into this battery sector. Even those who've been in the space for, you know, decades uh, felt like they learned something from it. And uh, just seeing that scale up, you know, it, Michigan, you know, there's new foundations forming uh, to help with training, you know, battery uh, associates, Volta Foundation and others. Uh, just really excited to see the ecosystem start to develop and, you know, build up those resources to help uh, retrain and bring in a lot of folks to this industry. And it's going very rapidly. Indeed. Yeah, a couple things to highlight there. So um, Paul mentioned that we uh, we are uh, releasing an open standard for battery data. Uh, he mentioned VDF, that stands for Voltaic Data Format. Um, so again, you can uh, follow us on LinkedIn and our company blog to, um, to get news about that as that'll be coming out uh, pretty shortly. And then another thing that I'm glad I had forgotten about this that I'm glad came up is that um, the University, to Mich University of Michigan Battery Lab does periodically run a short course in battery manufacturing. Um, that is, I think it's, a, is it a three-day course? Um, four. Four, four-day course where you actually will, you know, you, you go to the lab in person, um, you learn all the basics that you need to know about how batteries work, what the materials are, what the processes are, and then you'll actually get to build your own uh, cells on their pilot line um, and get an overview of how batteries are tested and analyzed. Um, so it's, uh, we've, We've been fortunate to send a few members of our team to that class, and I know I know that it books up quickly, and it also is competing for uh, time on your lines yeah. with uh, with paying customers. But it's uh, you know as as those opportunities arise to uh, to attend that battery manufacturing course, it can really be invaluable for folks looking to get into the field, understand the field better, and just get a really visceral understanding of what it actually takes to produce. Uh, something resembling a commercial battery. It's a, it's a very cool opportunity and cool resource. Um, so on that note, uh, Greg, if anyone listening wants to prototype or test batteries at the University of Michigan Battery Lab, what is the best way to get in touch and engage with you? Uh, just send me an email, g-l-e-s-s -S at u-m-i-c-h dot e-d-u. Uh, if you search U of M Battery Lab on Google, we hopefully will be the first hit. Um, and, you know, all the contact information is there as well. Uh, you can try calling me, emails better. Excellent. Wonderful. So um, with that, I think we're gonna go to questions from the audience. Again, encourage, uh, encourage those attending to submit questions if you haven't done so already and you have anything on your mind you'd like to ask about. Um, but we do have uh, one question here. So I'm gonna send this one over to Tal. What is Battery, what is open source battery data and where do I find it? Sure, so uh, you know, a requirement for a lot of publications these days is when you do release uh, a publication or a paper in an academic journal, uh, they require you to open source the data so that people can verify those results. Um, and so we're seeing a lot of open source data start to pop up and various locations, uh, whether it's GitHub repositories, you know, at university uh, lab 
repos you could download from uh, and other locations. And uh, you know, it, it is generally spread out across the web, but you could you could find some of it. There's also just some uh, you know enthusiasts who created data sets uh, and you know uploaded those as well. Uh, but there's a number of those out there in multiple locations that you can go and find. Um, the challenge is, you know, even once you find it, it's going to be in a variety of different formats, and just putting it into whatever analysis you want to do is going to take a lot of time and effort. And so, with the Voltaic Community Initiative that we mentioned, you could actually just uh, go sign up today to be one of the uh, users in closed beta for Voltaic Community and at VoltaicCommunity.com. That has all of this open source data, and it's continuing to grow that library of it. Uh, in a common format and easy to visualize, easy to throw in a secondary analysis directly in there, uh, you know, format and directly in this uh, Voltaic community software. So uh, you can go and find it and look for it online. Um, so this data that's open to use, open to run secondary analysis on. Uh, there's some of it out there, but we're trying to aggregate it and make it really easy to find and use all in one place. Indeed, yeah. So uh, our team has, has done some of the work to, you know, we you know we follow all the academic publications and all of the kind of hubs of activity around um, battery analysis, battery data science, and algorithm development. So part of what we've uh, done in uh, uh, sort of seeding the community is um, is to gather up all the data that we could find from all the leading uh, publications and such, and bring it in, into our system so that it's in an, in a common format. Um, <clears throat> And um, I, just one other thing to mention about the Voltaic community um, is that there are uh, there is functionality in there so that you can uh, actually publish your data, uh, sorry, publish your analysis within the community so that others can follow your work, comment on it, fork it, work on it themselves. So if you um, you know if you have some innovative algorithm that you want to uh, share with the community, you can actually. Uh, Publish it as what we call a showcase within the uh, the community Voltaic community system, um, where you can actually show, you know, your code if that's relevant, the data that uh, that your analysis is running on, and the results of it, kind of all um, uh, all in one place. Um, so it's something that we're hoping to help stimulate the uh, the interactions and collaborations across the community. So it's not it's not just your analytical techniques, it's not just your data, but it's actually the synthesis of those things that really uh, create value and insight for the broader community. Um, so there's a question, when do we plan to open Voltaic Community Edition to general access? Uh, we're targeting around the end of this year. Um, so as Tal mentioned, we are in closed beta. We are, we do have active users and we are onboarding more of them, but we're really uh, working to uh, really perfect all the perfect the system, work out any kind of technical issues, and make it as user friendly as possible, and um, uh, get it to where we feel uh, like it's really going to be uh, uh, compelling from day one. Uh, we feel like we're pretty close, so it's within the next couple months we'll be opening up to general access. But you can um, you can save your spot in line by going to voltaic.com slash community today. Um, another question, how can I enter for the four day short course and is it free or what's the typical cost? Uh, so unfortunately we haven't been able to run it since uh, the pandemic. I am working to fix that and I'm hoping to run it four times next year. Uh, kind of massaging the, the university bureaucracy right now to get it on the schedule. Um, so I don't know when it'll be offered again, hopefully in the January, February, March timeframe. Uh, it's not free, but because it's been a while, I don't know how much it will cost. If you want to stay in the loop for answers to all of these questions, uh, send me an email and I'll put you on our uh, distribution list. You won't be spammed. I send out uh, very, very few messages, usually uh, only announcements for when there are big changes to uh, the battery lab, when the class is open, or when reservation windows are open for the facility. Excellent. Um, next question is a great question. Uh, it's a it's a rather broad question, um, so we'll uh, we'll do our best to address address it in the time we have. Um, how how do you ensure that batteries are safe? Are there specific specific testing methods or safety norms? The answer is yes, there are. <laughs> there are a lot of them. <laughs> would, would that either of you like to uh, just 
just give an overview? Um, so yes, there, there are specific tests that you can do to make sure that the cell that you are testing is safe. Um, my more cynical answer is that batteries aren't safe, they're stored energy. Uh, anytime you have stored energy, whether that's a tank of gasoline, a firecracker, a bullet, or a battery, there's a risk that that energy is going to be released in a way that you don't want it to be. Um, so the tests that, that uh, Eli mentioned, um, there's a bunch of them. You choose which ones are most appropriate for your cell and its use case. You run those and you hope that if there's some manufacturing defect, you catch it in those tests before it's out in the field and causes a disaster. Um, that said, most of the problems that we're having right now with, with battery fires are manufacturing problems. And every time we have a manufacturing problem, we learn from it and we improve the process. And that specific problem generally doesn't happen again. Um, and I think we're going to continue down that path until we are as close to a perfect battery process as possible. And then these testing methods, um, especially with AI telling us what to look for early, will allow us to batch test more cells and catch these potential flaws faster so that we can test more batteries so that we're not needle in a haystacking for the ultimate problem. Indeed. Yeah, and I think yeah. uh, level eight, one other uh, side of it, just like specific tests, you know, it's a much, much longer discussion as Greg alluded to. Indeed. Um, but, you know, just when you're developing a new chemistry or battery cell, it's, there's a handful of like tests that you're looking for in the early days just to see how a battery is going to perform. So looking at the battery for overcharging, looking at it at elevated temperatures to see when the ignition points are. It's really important to, you know, if you have a new chemistry is looking at, you know, what that specification window to set your safety limitations are for uh, the equipment when you're running a battery test, you know, uh, making sure you're running in a way that's going to be safe and just trying to define those bounds uh, around uh, that battery cell, but yeah, independent of the chemistry limitations uh, generically for that system, uh, there's just a, a massive amount of these manufacturing defects that could cause safety concerns and trying to look for those and identify those or as soon as possible is really key here as we, Greg talked about. Indeed, yeah, it's a it's a very, very broad field and it goes from, you know, there's things that you can do in a lab in terms of overcharging a battery, heating it up, seeing what happens. And then we've, we've actually seen with some of our customers um, who, uh, you know, who are in the transportation sector, uh, you know, they literally do things like with a finished battery pack, they'll shoot it with a shotgun, uh, they'll drop a manhole cover on it from 20 feet up to simulate uh, uh, a vehicle being parked over uh, uh, an underground transformer, electrical transformer that sometimes blow up and shoot a manhole 20 feet in the air, uh, a manhole cover 20 feet in the air, um, you know, harsh vibrations, a giant kiddie pool that you dunk the, you know, dunk a whole battery pack in for three days and see, you know, if there's water infiltration. It's, it's, uh, it's a whole, it's a whole field. It's a, you know, it's a growth field. People are interested in doing that kind of destruction. Oh, there's nail penetration where you literally drive a nail through a battery and see if it ignites. Uh, there's, you know, there's a lot of cool stuff. You like to break stuff. Um, uh, battery abuse testing uh, is along with all of this is going to be, be a growth industry. So there's some fun to be had and a lot of um, safety standards to be adhered to. I, I will say that we've seen some labs that are um, uh, not everyone uh, tests batteries in the uh, in the safest way or has respect for how much energy is packed into these little devices um, and what can ha what can happen when things go wrong. Um, uh, that's a fun topic, but going to jump ahead to another question. So I think this is one is for Greg. Are you tracking parameters in the slurry making process and how successful are you at translating that to end cell quality? Um, interesting question. Uh, it's actually a question that uh, I just started a project with a professor here at U of M uh, looking at. Uh, more broadly, because we're a user facility and we're not interested in generating intellectual property, we let our users track their slurry parameters and track their cell data and do that correlation for themselves. Um, this project with the professor will obviously be an academic paper and there'll be a publication and 
what we're looking at will hopefully lead to faster mix times and better batteries in the end. Yeah. Tal, any comments from you on what you're seeing in the industry around uh, process optimization? Yeah, it's, it's connecting those dots from whether it's a slurry, uh, viscosity, or a coating thickness, uh, just all those different upstream variables are really you know, critical to making sure ultimately you have a good repeatable cell that's going to last uh, 10 years plus uh, in automotive. And so, uh, you know, there's a big push now to create traceability around this data. And uh, just uh, we're really excited on the voltaic front to really uh, dramatically enhance how we deal with metadata and track it and store it in one system for customers. And so, um, you know, you can have all of your performance data natively in there and then you could uh, configure the, the metadata on the user side very easily to be able to store uh, everything from you know, materials parameters to slurry viscosities to coding speeds, just have that all in one place uh, so you can look for those correlations very quickly. Indeed, yeah. In our work, you know, we've, we've certainly observed that uh, getting your process right and consistent and being able to track the uh, impacts of upstream changes on downstream sort of end of end of line cell quality that that's pretty much that's the whole game um and so of course we're uh we're continuing to build uh functionality into our soft software platform to uh to enable that um so with that it, it's it looks like we're about out of time um so we're going to wrap up the webinar here i'd like to thank our panelists again greg and tall as well as the audience for attending this event um a couple quick follow-ups so a lot of the topics uh, that we've talked about, um, we write about on our company blog, which you can access through our website. And there's some content uh, as well uh, in our Medium publication, uh, which is titled Batteries Are Complicated. If you just Google Batteries Are Complicated, you'll find it. Um, and you can also find a lot of good stuff on our blog. So we write about battery safety, manufacturing, um, you know, talent shortage, all that kind of stuff. Uh, there for folks that are interested in following up. Um, again, for folks interested in following up with Greg uh, and his facility, his email address is gless, that's gless at umich.edu, so U-M-I-C-H dot edu. .edu. Um, this webinar will be available on our website on demand uh, afterward, and if you have any questions, please feel to, free to reach out to us directly. Um, thanks everyone for attending. Thanks again to the panelists and have a great day. Thank you. Thanks all.